Tree Organization, Washington, D.C. Welcome to the lobby. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. On behalf of the Biotechnology Industry Organization, or BIO, I would like to thank you for providing me the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the United States trade relationship with India. BIO represents more than 1,100 companies, universities, research institutions, and related organizations focusing on the research and development of novel biotechnology products and applications in the area of healthcare, agriculture, and the environment. The vast majority of BIO's members are small and medium-sized enterprises that currently do not have products on the market. As such, BIO's members rely heavily on the strength and scope of their patents to generate investment to take their technologies to commercialization. More and more, BIO's members are looking abroad as they expand their markets in R&D and commercialization efforts. The biotech industry relies heavily on intellectual property. The development of a single biotech product often takes more than a decade to be commercialized and can require more than a billion dollars in capital investment, a significant amount of which comes from private sources. Biotech product development is also fraught with high risk as the vast majority of biotech products fail to ever reach the marketplace. In addition, while biotech health inventions are entitled to the same patent term as all other inventions 20 years from the time they are filed, they have the additional hurdle of a rigorous pre-launch regulatory review process during which they may lose between 8 to 10 years of the patent life. Venture capital firms invest in capital-intensive, long-term, and high-risk research and development endeavors only if they believe there will be a return on their investment. Patents help provide this assurance. According to a patent survey conducted by the researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, 73% of biotech entrepreneurs surveyed reported that potential funders, such as venture capitalists, angel investors, and commercial banks, etc., indicated patents were an important factor in their investment decisions. Without strong, predictable patent protection, investors will shy away from investing in biotech innovation and will simply put their money into projects or products that are less risky, without regard to the great societal value biotech can offer. Difficulty in obtaining and enforcing intellectual property rights in India remains a barrier to biotech companies. In the past year, the government of India has taken a number of very serious steps to revoke protection on widely patented biopharmaceutical products. These setbacks include a pattern of patent revocations compulsory license and threatened, and threatened compulsory licenses and other instances where patents were rendered unenforceable. While the justifications differ to some degree, these actions amount to what are localization barriers to trade. By systematically curtailing the IP rights of innovative biotechnology companies, the US R in industry's R&D investment is negatively impacted. Beyond the short-term financial impact these actions have on US companies operating in the Indian market, these actions have ex an extended impact on U.S. companies and other markets, as Indian companies are now in a position to legally export these medicines to third countries, where U.S. companies do not normally seek patent protection, but would have otherwise turned to U.S. companies to meet their pharmaceutical needs. The Indian government claims that, in instituting such anti-IP policies, it is taking steps to keep the prices of medicines down and improve access to medicines. However, we contend that these actions are in reality a form of industrial policy designed to improve local commercial interests at the expense of U.S. biotech companies. These steps by the Indian government benefit in a very tangible manner its domestic pharmaceutical industry. The medicines being targeted are highly specialized anti-cancer medicines that benefit a small fraction of India's patient population. And only those who can already afford the highly specialized medical talent and facilities to properly diagnose and treat the relevant forms of cancer. We recognize that India has a severe problem of access to health care, particularly for the lower income strata of its population. Indeed, a number of U.S. pharmaceutical companies have extensive patient assistance programs and other programs to improve access to health care. However, the steps being taken by the Indian government to remove IP protection of these highly specialized medicines have a very limited benefit for its citizens in terms of affordability or access to medicines. Meanwhile, the far greater majority of patients who suffer from more common ailments see little to no benefit from these anti-IP policies. None of the drugs on, of, on India's essential drug <coughs> list are patented. Yet, according to the WHO, only 20% of the Indian population can afford these generic medicines. While the government has, with great fanfare, gone forward to grant domestic competitors compulsory licenses to form patented medicines impacting relevant, relatively few patients, proposals to provide cheap generic medicines to the poorest are put on the back burner and quietly forgotten. In the meantime, the Indian domestic industry benefits from the lax IP protections by being able to introduce copies or similar versions of these medicines in an alleged TRIPS compliant fashion into the Indian market. And those of other developing countries 
many years earlier than would otherwise be permitted. While the market for patented medicines within India is quite small, less than 1%, the real motivation for the Indian generic industry and government is to export these products to developed countries, a more lucrative market growing at a rate of 15% per year. In the United States, Indian, com Indian companies enjoy U.S. trade benefits and protections, something our companies do not enjoy in India. While the, situated, while the situation in India is of major concern to our members, we are extremely concerned about the spillover effects of these policies and encouraging other countries to take similar actions. We already have begun to notice other emerging and pre-emerging markets, such as China, Indonesia, South Africa, and Greece, instituting or considering similar policies. Beyond their weak intellectual property system, India has systematically put in place other market barriers that make it difficult for U.S. companies to operate in the Indian marketplace. These include new or revised regulations impacting foreign direct investment, clinical research, biopharmaceutical price controls, and a de facto moratorium on testing and evaluating genetically modified crops. India has begun to put in place new rules restricting the type and amount of FDI, foreign direct investment, in biotech and pharma companies. Previously, all FDI was automatically approved. Beginning in 2012, foreign investors wishing to invest in the biotech and pharma sector must now seek approval from the government. Criteria for the approval of such proposals by the government are not clear, and both the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, the IPP, and the Health Ministry recently circulated proposals within the government to, cur to, cur to curtail investment even further. For example, limiting investment in existing ventures to 49%. Thankfully, this proposal was recently set aside. However, in doing so, DIPP officials did, it did incorporate new language outlawing, except under special circumstances, non-compete clauses, commonly used by companies to protect themselves from future competition from their opposite party in a transaction. No guidance was provided as to what those circumstance, special circumstances would be. As before, criteria and timelines for approval are vague, and wide discretion is given to government officials. As a result of the confusion and fruitless debate, U.S. companies who wish to invest in the Indian market are forced to look elsewhere denying India of both foreign capital and expertise. In the area of clinical research, I will only point out, I know a colleague here will be testifying on that in a moment, but I, might, I, wanted, to, to, um, I wanted to state that finally since January 2013, new clinical trials approved by the Health Ministry and the Supreme Court have dropped a stunning 93% over the previous year. This suspension has brought the entire clinical research community practically to a standstill. Is presenting, is, and is preventing the, the Indian introduction of new innovative medicines and medical devices, all of which must undergo clinical trials in India before receiving marketing approval. In the area of price controls, after a long protracted debate, the government of India issued in early 2013 a new drug price control order, which imposed new price controls on a wide range of biopharmaceutical products. In this regard, we know that we note that the government of India has taken the positive step of moving from a cost basis method of price control to a market based method. However, if the policy has led to shortages of these medicines in certain regions as distributors are unwilling or unable to supply the medicines at the set price. More concern, the Indian government is currently contemplating the imposition of additional price controls specifically on patented medicines, with several proposals being debated. We are concerned about the long term impact these policies will have on the ability for innovative biopharmaceutical companies to continue its investment in research and development particularly Indian innovative companies, which must consider India their primary market. Price controls have a negative impact on the ability of innovative companies to receive a return on their R&D investment. Without adequate return on their investment, these companies will have fewer incentives to conduct expensive research and testing of new products. Pricing policies should, as a general rule, be transparent and predictable mechanisms which reward innovation. Furthermore, merely introducing price controls on biopharmaceutical products may not substantially improve citizens' access to healthcare, since there are many other barriers to healthcare particularly inadequate health infrastructure, the lack of qualified health professionals, and the absence of health financing or insurance. Finally, let me point out a few things real quickly in the genetically modified crop area. Uh, both U.S. companies and Indian scientists have developed a long list of new genetically modified GM crops, a variety of commercial valuable trades. However, none of these GM crops will be able to receive final regulatory approval from the Indian government due to unfounded concerns of the safety of these crops. The government is studying alleged deficiencies in the government's regulatory and safety systems, thereby delaying the approval of such products. Field trials using these crops have been effectively stopped until these issues have been addressed. Moreover, while the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee has met on the issue in an attempt to address the issue, their official output is inconsistent and the system is currently non-functioning and unpredictable. 
Finally, the, the <coughs> Biodiversity Act specifies that a non-Indian requires national biodiversity authority approval before obtaining a biological research, resource occurring in India. However, non-Indians are exempt from seeking NBA approval for the same biological resource. This discriminatory practice has significantly impacted the agricultural sector represented by non-Indians whose very routine research and breeding programs activities require NBA approval. I see that my time is concluded, so thank you for this opportunity to make comments. If you have additional questions or follow-up, we'll be happy to respond. Thank you.